welcome to Monday Night TPK. Hey, welcome back. This is Monday Night TPK. My name is Kyle, and I will be your DM for this 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons Real Play Podcast. Okay, thanks for nodding your heads, guys. Make sure I'm hitting all my checkpoints here. <laughs> One of these days, I'll write these down and just have like a note in front of me of what to say. No, start, I, no, I won't. Start shaking my head just to throw you off. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, so we are currently running through the Tomb of Annihilation, and I feel like I, I feel like as the DM that we are making real story progress. Um. I feel like there have been times and moments that we didn't make real story progress for months at a time. Months of us playing at a time. But, uh, yeah, I think I think we're coming towards some good plot points that hopefully are worth the journey. Both literally and, you know, metaphorically speaking. So, around me at the table are four people. Um, if this is your first time listening to us, you should not be shocked by who they are. Um, we have, first of all, to my right, we have Sam playing Gilly, the halfling cleric, who is always hungry and always in a good mood. Is that snack time? Nearly there, Gilly. Nearly there. Oh. Next to Sam sits Matt, playing our uh, adventurous, sometimes hot-tempered uh, Eladrin, I think you're an Eladrin, right? Yep. Eladrin Rogue. Nope, sorry, nope. Ranger. There you go. The other one that starts with an R. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's always the life of a party and has a fantastic singing voice. <laughs> Maybe at some point in her life. Yeah, ouch. Across from Matt sits Ryan. Ryan's character is named Ruvain. He's a, a high elf wizard, I believe. You're a high elf, right, Ryan? Correct, yes. And he is still relatively new to the land of Chult, new to the jungle, new to the heat, having only been here for a couple days now. His um, character died. Yeah, um. his character died. So Ruvain hasn't necessarily, you know, become bitter and angry with the jungle, the same way some of the other characters have. <laughs> Sitting next to Ryan, uh, and to my left, is Dana. Who's playing? Oh, Dana chose that moment to dump out a whole bunch of dice. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, no problem. Dana plays Rixer. Mm -hmm. Rixer is our orcish fighter. Oh, completely orc, actually. Full orc. That's mm -hmm. why I said orcish. As in As orc like. In, uh, mm -hmm. Okay, you're not just orcish, you're full orc. I yes. get it. That's actually kind of funny. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, These are the jokes, people. <laughs> yeah, this is Get why used this, to it. this is why no one listens to us. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, uh, for these jokes right here. But yeah, Rixer's a fighter. Yeah, I think you specialize down the um Samurai, samurai path. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. And yeah, I've played a lot of fighters, but not this particular archetype of it. Sweet. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Maybe someday you'll level up and be able to explore this path even further. Mm, hopefully. Shaking my head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my character, however, is not actually a samurai. Just, like, the components of that yeah. work the best. He's not actually a samurai. He just plays one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> He's not actually a samurai. He just stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> do those commercials even still exist? I do believe so. Do they? Yeah. Holiday Inn Express is not a sponsor of Monday Night TPK. <laughs> oh, let's face it. Nobody or and nothing is a sponsor of Monday Night TPK. But if you're interested, <laughs> <laughs> you probably shouldn't. All right. So as you may know, uh, Sam takes fantastic notes every game. We don't even have to pay her for it. Sam, do you want to tell us uh, what exactly happened last week on Monday Night TPK? Sure. On episode 42, we heard... Oh, nope. I'm sorry. That sentence is confusing. Okay. On episode 42, we chattered in our vessels amongst the fog, deciding our next course of action. 
Um, Kyle informed us that soulmonger is an important term that we will be tested on later. Mm. Gilly suggested we go back and keep our distance to assess the situation further. These were these guys across the river calling for help. Yes, yes, I remember now. Okay. Uh, we headed back up river and tied off our boats, and we heard the clanking of armor on the opposite side of the river, so we dispersed the fog cloud. We found a red-bearded man and a tall woman standing across the river in front of the large fort. Um, we asked questions of the group of people there. Um, as we asked questions and then came to get excuse me, came together to decide our next course of action. Um, a higher ranking officer in command uh, came out of the fort and started scolding the group, trying to solicit our attention and assistance. He eventually turned to us and commanded us to give our supplies and canoes and our work efforts. Um, so we brought the fog cloud back and pieced out. <laughs> um, but not before Brielle shot an arrow with a message on it over to the other side of the river. Speaking of that, I never gave you the note for that. I was just thinking that I'm going to want to know what that says. That, yep. There's a chance that could come back, so. Here it is. Oh, lit. Okay. It was in my folder. That's not very appropriate, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll put it in my folder because, as I said, that might come back, depending on your actions. Um, we pieced out and went further downriver, and Iku warned us that we were near the Aldani Basin with more creatures and dinosaurs that we have not yet seen. We navigated some narrow passages within the basin, and we began looking for dry land to camp. Uh, we thought we were going past um, four large trees, but then realized that we were underneath a giant four-legged dinosaur. Uh, after we've navigated that situation, we stopped to find, um, make camp for the night, rather. Ruvain set up alarms around the camp and Rixer helped, quote-unquote. Rixer sealed um, his Choinga statue, so finally finishing that. Um, we set up watches for the night, and the first half um, was Ruvain and Rixer, second half being Gilly and Brielle. The first half of the watch was um, a little bit more active than we were used to, the animal life was, rather. Um, and for some reason, I wrote, the bugs are gross. So there you have it. Uh, second half of watch, loud stomping approached. Brielle attempted to make sense of the sound and asked Iku, Braille and Iku started to wake everyone else. Um, Gilly heard two feet approaching, and we readied ourselves for action. Uh, soon we saw a nine-foot-tall man emerge from the foliage, missing one arm as it looked like the other had been bitten off. Um, and Gilly and a few other members had hidden amongst the brush to try to keep a low profile, but this um, nine-foot-tall man found Gilly, bent over, and said, Arrival complete. It's my guardian. Hmm. Hooray! Yeah, so we're looking uh, more or less, uh, I don't know, super... A few hours past uh, midnight, I guess is what I'm trying to say here. Um, you're all awake. This... Nine foot tall metal sort of man who looks very humanoid. Um, if not for the fact that it's a missing one arm and a shoulder and a good portion of its uh, chest. And it totally fits in our boats. Yeah. Well, just, just, just chill with it. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> uh, it's standing before you, perfectly still. Uh, its feet are. Spaced apart wide enough to provide very good balance on its very, very large shoe, metal uh, feet, I guess, shoes, boots. Um, its remaining hand is clenched tight into a fist. And it stands there. I'm so glad you're here. Do you require sleep? Um, it, it doesn't respond in any way. 
It stands there, motionless. Good. I'm taking that as a no. Keep watch. If you see something, wake me up gently. Watch mode. Engaged. Excellent. And it begins to, like, march a loud, thunderous, stomping (gasps) circle. Stop! And it freezes. Quietly. It very slowly marches a very wide-spaced circle. Still thumping? No, it's going going very slowly. Slow enough that it's not actually making a lot of noise. But it's moving, begins to move in a perimeter around your campsite. Stop! It freezes. Come sit down. It, uh... And I point to an open space in the middle of camp. (laughs) It... Stops. It moves. It moves to that space. Uh, stands there for a moment, and then heavily just like thuds to the ground. Like a June bug. <laughs> Watch mode. Sitting. <laughs> it. Uh, its head begins to swivel 360 degrees. <laughs> like That's ex- great. exorcist style. <laughs> like in a slow panning uh, spin. Perfect. I'm going back to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is sitting in the middle of your camp, guys. <laughs> Rickster sits next to it and tries to make conversation with it. <laughs> What what does Rickster say to this, Dana? You're really tall. And doesn't respond. That's okay. I'm shy sometimes too. But I'll be your friend. He does not respond. Um okay. I I'll just wait till you're ready. And we'll just keep sitting there. Because well, it's currently Rickster's watch, right? I do not recall what watch so. it was. Uh, yeah. It was Brielle and Iku? Yeah, it was oh, like okay. Brielle and Iku, I think, because Iku was like in the middle of the, the awkward watch. Yeah, you guys finished your watches. Okay. I'm fresh. gonna recover for, or I'm gonna take over for Iku here in like three hours. Okay. Three, four hours. Uh, so Rickster will just sit up. Uh, with it for like 10 minutes and he starts to kind of like doze off a little bit uh-huh. and then realizes it and goes back to bed. It continues there to sit and, sit and spin. <laughs> um, before moving goes back to his, um, his rest, um, is it possible to, I mean I know what the damage to the shield guardian is, but is it possible to um, kind of gauge the extent of it to like if it's beyond repair um give me a give me a knowledge of arcana all right nice it's 15 on the die plus my mod is 21. yeah i mean that's a that's a pretty good roll um i would say that that ruvain yeah, I'm not looking to repair it right now, but yeah, it's, it's... I understand that. <laughs> you don't know exactly what it would take to repair it. Yeah, uh, but you can kind of examine it. And it's not moving. It's not going anywhere. You can examine it pretty closely mm-hmm. and get the idea that um, it probably could be repaired. Like you can kind of like see into its breastplate a little bit um, and see that it's a mixture of uh, some sort of like dark, dark wood and metal and that there are arcane symbols just all kind, all, all over the place inside of it. And you can see where some of these arcane symbols have been damaged and scuffed and broken in addition to the physical bending and warping and twisting and tearing of the metal and the wood inside of it. Okay. Um, so you think that it could possibly be repaired? You just don't have the means. But it would take some, it's well beyond anything you have at your disposal. Right. No mending cantrip. Gotcha. Men, yeah, mending cantrip isn't going to do anything for you. I don't have it anyway, so. <laughs> um, no, I'm just looking at looking over, taking the extent of damages in. Sure, give me a, a general perception check. Sure thing. General. 
General perception. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I like suddenly couldn't say that word. What you got, Ryan? A grand total seven with a one on a dice. Oh. Hey, yikes. Uh, well, tell you what, here you got. You broke the very easy DC. <laughs> what I roll? <laughs> um. It it looks like it's been maybe in the jungle for a long time. Hmm. It's covered in bird crap. Oh. <laughs> um, Pooper chocolate. I'll give you for free because you're trained in Arcana that uh, the only reason why it's probably not rusted and decayed is the fact that it's like endowed with magical properties. Right. Um, so it's old is what you're saying. I mean, it's been in the jungle for quite a while at least. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you had a twenty while you were like really looking at it closely. Yeah. You also can see that like it looks like critters may have gotten inside of it <laughs> because you, you know, like I said, its chest cavity is pretty much open, and you can see like leaves and fur, uh, and you know sticks and twigs and you know broken up pizza pieces of <laughs> uh, shells from nuts. Uh, there's feces in there from animal droppings. Something may have called this home before it started moving. So I'll just continue my, like, look over a bit and... First thing in the morning, it gets you cleaned up. Its head is just swelling. <laughs> it reminds me of the, the guardians in um, Castle in the Sky. Yes. I haven't seen that. You've never seen Castle in the Sky? It's so good. They were like, they're up and they were garden maintainers or something like that. It's been a long time since I watched it, but like animals lived on them and mm-hmm. in parts of them and stuff. Yeah, I just remember them being like completely covered in moss and yeah. stuff like they that. Were caretakers. Yeah, and of then the, of the castle. And then like being activated. Yeah, when they got me. Yeah. So your the rest of your watch or the rest of your night. Goes by pretty smoothly. Sun comes up. Um, uh, just as people are beginning to beginning to wake up for the day, um, Iku is actually going to go out into the jungle a little bit to see if she can scavenge anything. Brielle will go help her. Sure. She, she's more than happy to take you into the forest. So we do benefit from our uh, long rest. Then. You benefit from your long rest? Hey, Matt, why don't you make a survival check with advantage? Take that second one. Uh, let's see. That is an unnatural 20. Roll me a d8. Um, so you guys are kind of looking around, and she seems to be just scanning the jungle, um, and kind of, like, as you kind of come into, a uh, by an overturned tree, uh, she kind of puts a hand out to stop you, and then she points down into the, the earth that's been opened up by the falling of, the falling of the tree, like, where its roots are kind of sticking out. She'll say to you, look at these roots here. These are... These are wild roots. This is a very, very, uh, very good omen. And she'll kind of bend down and kind of pulls a small knife out of her belt and kind of like cuts here, cut here and there. Um, and she's going to tell you that uh, if you see here, introducing the juice of a wild root into a poison creature's bloodstream, for example, by rubbing it on an open wound, rids the creature of the poisoned condition. Ooh. So this is very good for carrying poisons if you if you squeeze it and can get the sap and the juice out of it. Ooh. And she's able to cut like two um five, six inch long lengths of this kind of like twisty twisty root. Okay. Um and she hands them to you. Um I can put them in a satchel, I guess. But I have like a I probably have like a little side pouch. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Something like that. And that's really what you guys would would find. 
Okay. That's actually worked as like an anti poison or something. Okay. I said there was three of them? Two of them. Two of them. Um, as in Rixer, not Rixer, and uh, Iku and Brielle aren't probably gone for more than 20 to 30 minutes or something at the most. Uh, I'm guessing the rest of you are probably starting to break camp down. Mm-hmm. For sure. Okay. You're able to do so with no real difficulty. Nice. Um, Iku is going to tell you uh, that we have gone as far as we can for now on the river. The rest of our journey uh, to to see the oracle must be made across land. Mm. What do we do with the boats? She shrugs. Fireball. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, in in terms of carrying supplies, um, you were able to carry a boat before, mm-hmm. if that is your wish. Mm. Probably farther though, right? Um. She will uh, tell you that. When I was looking over uh, Guardian there, um, that the the. the Chunk that he's missing on his side there, is that by any chance hollow? No, not really. Um, It's got kind of a cross section of like support beams essentially inside of him. No luggage. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just stuffing full of stuff. Um, She's going to tell you that uh, on foot from here, it will take us probably five to six days to reach the Oracle at Oralunga. and this is also where I must ask you, um, uh, we, well, we, we will be passing very close to the forgotten city of Umbala, where, as I told you before, uh, I, I believe an evil hag lives. Um, she is a, a menace to the jungle and quite a cunning and dangerous foe. Um, I typically have always avoided her in the past, but... Eliminating her may do some good if you think you're up to the challenge. If not, I can I can easily lead us around her her homestead uh, on our way. I don't think we should take any unnecessary risks. <clears throat> Uh, Brielle will say that, uh, but if she is a hindrance to other travelers, then she's probably literally eating people. That's fair. Maybe we should. This this jungle's already dangerous enough. You're right, Brielle. Eating people is bad. I wouldn't want to be eaten. That would be terrible. <laughs> so maybe taking out. One nuisance isn't such a bad idea. Okay, I know what we should do now. So, we can put all of our stuff into one boat, right? So, we put it all in one boat, and we get some rope, and we make a harness, and then we get a dinosaur, and the dinosaur can pull everything for us. That's what we should do. You guys could very clearly see across the, the basin behind, you know, it's behind you really, because you're right at the edge of it. I mean, you can see several, like, brontosaurus just, like, towering above, <laughs> towering above the, the tree line. Just saying. Um, or... Bria, Bria, Bria will say, uh... I don't think any of us are skilled enough to tame a dinosaur. Yeah, uh, Brielle made a good point that we're not, um, none of us have the skill to tame a dinosaur, per se. I rode on a dinosaur, though. You did, and that was awesome. Yeah. But also, we have my friend here, point to Shield Guardian, I'm sure still sitting and head rotating. 100%. 100%. Mm-hmm. I think he might be able to help us. Let's okay. load so, it. Go ahead. 
Okay, sounds good. Let's load up a boat and see if he can carry it. With okay. one arm. So, do we have the... I imagine we would have loaded up the boat, question mark? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's see, I think you guys were breaking down stuff. I yeah. Think we're in the woods. Shield Guardian. Awaiting command. Cease watch mode. It stops, but it's like when you say it, it's kind of like backwards. <laughs> and it like it stops there for a second before like then turning back around to face you. Um, lift this boat gently. Do not drop anything from it. It it gets to its uh, great big feet. Um. And grabs hold of the boat in the center. And with one hand, it does kind of struggle a little bit to like just have the balance to be able to lift it properly. Okay. Um, you get the, like, it's picking it up. It's also, like, just because of where it's grabbed onto one spot of the boat, it's not doing it very gracefully. Stop, stop. And let's go. No, gently put it down. It has already dropped it. <laughs> uh, how far did it fall? I mean, like a foot and a half. Oh. Okay. Why don't we just attach a rope to the front of the boat and have him pull it? Then we'd be leaving a trail for people to follow behind us. But what people? The people that we probably just pissed off. Oh, or that's true. They're further away, though. But it doesn't mean they're not following. But also we have big old gigantic, I need to come up with a name for you, big old gigantic shield guard, this guy, this guy's footprints. Yeah, yeah, and also all the noise that he's going to be making, he's going to draw all the attention. So what's the difference if he drags the boat or not? Because if he's drawing attention, people will be able to easily follow the trail of where we are. Oh, that's smart. The footprints are going to echo, but if they mm. come towards where they're at, they're just going to be able to follow the trail. Can we make like a rope backpack? Hmm. I really need to learn this hand language. Uh, I can teach you a little bit. Sorry guys, we're talking about real things is a bad idea for us to have the shield guardian drag the boat because there will be a big path that will lead us Lead them right to us. So I'm trying to come up with other solutions for us not to have to carry the boat and the shield guardian to do more work. We have some tarps, right? I think so. We have our rain tarps, uh, which I believe we have two of them, and I think we have just two normal tarps. Okay. Sounds right. Okay. So we have the boat, and we put the stuff in the boat. Just the smallest boat. Because there's a a canoe and the two rowboats, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So the small boats. And then put the tarp on top and tie it around, around and around. And then put it against the shield guardian's back, like the tarp facing it. So it keeps everything in. And then you tie it on it around and around and around. Backpack. That's a pretty good yeah, idea. Not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we should. Uh, Gilly pauses and like looks up and looks into up and down at the shield guardian. I think we should have the strap be around its neck. Hmm. So it doesn't fall off. Is it missing a shoulder? Will you go. Oh, it's shoulder completely. Whole okay. shoulder's gone. Okay. Yeah, so oh, that's how it has a big enough hole. <clears throat> yeah, it would have to go around this neck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think that'll hurt it, though. Do you care if we talk about you in the third person? Uh, it doesn't directly respond to that question. Okay. <laughs> Do you have love? a name? <laughs> it doesn't respond. Do you have a name? Um, What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> Current designation is Vorn. Where are you from originally? 
It doesn't answer that, do you? <laughs> but you get a point of inspiration for it. I already have one, Kyle. You know that. Oh, darn. <laughs> okay, born. It doesn't respond to that? There's no... Nothing there to respond to. Yeah. Oh, you're writing the title. You have to slow down right now. Okay. So... <laughs> what is it? We create a backpack, tie it around, so there's a strap around Vorn's neck, and then we go. Sound good? Should we have some little supplies, like, in our own pack still? So we can oh. get them easy without having well, to take it down. And... Pack. Okay. Real, real will say we should carry our own packs always. Yeah, um, wait, sir, I've been doing that. And I've been having those things in my pack. If you want some help picking out some stuff, I can help you with that. No, I just put, I'll just put my own stuff in my bag and not the boat. Solid plan. Okay. Awesome. So you guys um, have definitely made something resembling a plan. <laughs> and Rick Serve will help, like, pack the boat and everything. Try to make it, like, as efficient and tight you can. Cool. Who is the one constructing this uh, backpack? Uh, Rick Sir will. Can yeah, like... Real will help whoever's doing it. Yeah, I was gonna say, can like Gilly sort of brains the operation while it's Rick like, Sir... Able to reach to <laughs> right. Put a rope around this guy's neck. Right. Make him sit down. Oh, okay. And then we put it on. Okay. So, I guess that's my question, is if um, Gilly can kind of help, like, direct the actions that are happening while Rick sort of does them. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like, the strength to tie, Gilly doesn't have, but right. Rick does. Right. The and intelligence and wisdom to figure out where to put the ropes... I mean, Rickster has actually a decent wisdom awesome. from just, like, experiences. It's his intelligence that's low. Oh, that's right. And yeah. you would have experience with, like, the animals and mm -hmm. whatnot. And, like, packing wagons and whatnot. Go for it. So, yeah. Probably the most, like, the most helpful part would be figuring out how to put it on the Shield Guardian. Yeah. Okay. So, with Rickster's experience with packing wagons and tending animals and harnesses and all that kind of fun stuff, um... You can pretty easily, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time to do it properly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you're not going to make you roll dice because you're not like you're under arrow fire or you're not right. doing this during battle or something, right? So it takes a little bit of time to do, it pro do the job properly, but after probably 10, 15 minutes or so, you guys get everything for the most part broken down. Um, I'd argue that, you know, you might, like, you got how many barrels of water, for example? Or, like, you, you start out with some barrels, and you got some smaller barrels. Like, yeah, some of that bigger know. stuff, you decide if you're going to keep it or... I mean, it, it won't all fit in one boat. I guess you had it all in one boat, didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did at one point. We had I mean, uh, two five-gallon five casks. Uh, we had three of those, because we had the one that was possibly full of um, alcohol that we washed out. Okay, yeah, um, I forgot that you guys had already got it loaded into one boat size, so you are able to get it all okay. onto his back. The only potential issue would be, like, whenever the boat is how it's meant to be, you can kind of have things sticking up out of the boat, with it being a backpack. It'd have to all be flush with the top of the boat. Right. So if it was, like, a super packed before, then maybe it wouldn't fit, but... Um... Iku is going to chime in, because, again, she's my voice in all this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a good system, I think. Uh, I would worry, though, if we could ambush um, our, our new guardian friend here. Um, he won't be able to quickly and easily leave the supplies in a safe location. Oh, that's fair. Crap. That's not to say that it's a bad idea, or that I think you should change anything, just as long as we're aware that if uh, we get attacked by the undead, for example, um, things may get damaged. Born, are you opposed to carrying a robot like a purse? 
<laughs> Vorn follows your commands. Vorn's gonna get a purse. <laughs> Hold on. There are knots that you can tie that will stay sturdy until you pull a certain thread on it. But then so crash. It'll just sl- the boat will just slide off its back. Having to do no the combat. But then crash. I'm not gonna damage the boat. The boat's probably like already almost touching the ground. The boat is 15 feet long. Oh, that's true. He's only 9 feet tall. Well, the canoe is. I'm not sure about the robots, but anyways, it doesn't matter. But I think they're all the same. I think mm-hmm. Kyle said they're all okay. the same. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that would work. Well, all we'd have to do is make one that's tight while he's walking, and then all we have to do is pull that one rope line, and then the whole thing just slides right off his back. Right. And, and then we'll, boom, he's combat ready. And Gilly should, would probably be able to even, like, Command him to do that himself. And, I believe, so. and with our backgrounds between me and you, Dana, mm-hmm. um, I believe one of us should be able to know how to tie that. Yeah, that. yeah, for sure. I'm gonna have one of you guys make me a sleight of hand check though to make this super complicated, interesting knot. Do you want to do it, or I'm not trained in it, so I won't be able to help you. And I have a plus I'm two. I'm not. I'm not trained in sleight of hand either, but I have a plus two to Dex. Well, there are some random spirits here that could give uh, some sort of, yeah, we some don't sort have of help. That. We don't have that advantage anymore. <laughs> that's still not bad, though. Uh, that was a 12 on the dice, so that's a total of 14. Well, you, you pull it off. It looks uh, it looks pretty good. Cool. Good idea. You guys now have a crazy quick-release rope system <laughs> to drop the boat at the drop of a boat. <laughs> Awesome. So once you've got your your new friend fully loaded, <laughs> uh, like a taco, like a taco. <laughs> uh, sure. Why the heck not? <laughs> you guys head off into into the jungle. Um, you were originally just kind of right on the edge of this Aldani Basin, and you feel like you're probably going to be in this jungle area for a while. But it seems like you're heading back into the jungle proper. Um, about probably uh, two or three hours into your, into your morning hike, um, a snake drops down from a tree above you and you stop because it's kind of startling and after, and you expect it to probably drop on you, even, until its tiny little wings unfold, <laughs> and a single flying snake uh, buzzes probably three or four feet above your heads um, in quick, almost hummingbird-like darting motion, uh, checking you guys out. How big is it? Um, it's a, it's a small size... Small size creature. Realis is in the book. <laughs> Nature check? Go for it. <clears throat> 12 again. Uh, 16. Not sure if it's in the book. I haven't used bowls. I haven't got bowls out in a while. Brian's right, clipping out right now. <laughs> I think I know what it is. It is a snake with wings. I mean, there's a lot of size variety variety in snakes. Yeah, I wasn't expecting you guys to ask me what size it is. I mean, I feel like that <laughs> kind of changes wings. kind of changes yeah. like how intimidating or potential of a mm-hmm. threat it is. That's a hundred percent. Is it normal there. black colors, or is it very colorful? Right. Yeah, the, the colors are important too. But I mean, like, if this thing is like a foot long, it's, it's, okay. It's, 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 it's small. So. It, yeah. Right. But it like if it's, it's like two and a half feet. Probably just a normal flying snake, which is making Ryan's red alert go off. <laughs> but how big is a normal flying snake? Small. Is it just a small creature? Is a tiny creature. It's baby. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a tiny sized creature. It is brightly colored. It's a winged serpent. Um, 
It's got kind of a white feathery, feathery wings. Um, its whole body is kind of a, a mottled uh, bright green and red and yellow That's coloring. Um, Iku actually is going to get a, a, a kind of a wide smile on her face. And she's like, oh, hello, my friend. And she'll step forward and kind of put her hand out. Parcel talk. Uh, and it kind of like will wrap itself, kind of coil itself around her wrist. Whoa. And she just kind of will, will hold it, kind of keep her arm out. And its, it's wings are still fluttering, but most of its body just kind of wrap itself around her. And it's like, my friends, this is a, this is a flying snake. Mm-hmm. Well, it, obviously. It, it's a snake. <laughs> it is most, most adorable. Good mm-hmm. journeys, my friend. And she'll kind of like, kind of like put her hand out a little quickly and kind of release it and it flutters back up into the, into the trees. Mm. Wow. They are not completely uncommon in, the, in these parts of the jungle. Um, but aside from a tiny little flying snake friend, that is the mm-hmm. only remarkable, remarkable thing throughout your day. Hmm. Um, you're able to kind of walk on until it is time, time for nightfall, <laughs> and uh, begin to make camp. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Uh, a good spot to make camp. Yep. Um, you guys don't really have much of a problem with that. Um, camp is made. Go set my alarms. Alarms are me- are set. You double check them three or four times just to make sure you don't oversleep. Um, you guys, anything special for the night? Um, has Iku told us how far Oranga is? She told you it was five or six days from your previous location. Wait, which one am I thinking? The one with the hat you Oh, she, you guys the ones didn't. That one? That's Umbala. Umbala. Oh, gosh, these sound so familiar. We're, similar we're going to Oralonga. Okay. We're going to Oralonga. Yep. And he does start looking at my notes when I ask questions. So you guys are able to go uh, to a, a day's travel. Um, I'll tell you that you'll hit Umbala, I mean, hit or go around Umbala in uh, two days. So I guess just typical camp setup routines and sure. stuff like that. Not a problem. Eat our dinner. You guys eat your food. Some rest. I'm assuming you have pretty much the same watch cycle as before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you use your new friend to uh, assist with that? Yeah, he's gonna sit and watch. He's gonna sit and watch. <laughs> yep. You can park him in the center of camp. His head is literally on a swivel, okay. or not even a swivel, it's just on like a, a rotator. Mm-hmm. And it kind of goes round and round and round. Um, I want to instruct him as well this time that if there is danger, to quickly and quietly alert me. Acknowledged. Thanks, Born. No response. Yeah. That's fine. It's still polite. Um, your night goes peacefully. Uh, you, you hear, you know, normal night insects. It's, it's pretty great. Nice. Uh, morning comes and I'm assuming that, uh, I'm assuming that you guys break camp and continue your way. Okay. Mm-hmm. Letting Iku take the lead again on... Uh, navigation yeah, checks? Correct. Sure. Cool. So, this next day, um, just as you're beginning to leave camp, the rain starts to pick up. And the rain starts to get heavier and heavier and heavier um, until it is just a, just a downpouring. Hmm. It is an incredibly heavy rain. Um, and very quickly, you're walking through thick mud. Good, that will drown out the sounds of the... <laughs> yeah, he doesn't seem to be slowed down a whole lot by it. Uh, I mean, and when I say thick mud, you know, we're not talking like, you know, waist-high mud by any means. Right. But, like, 
you know, was up to your ankles anyway. And if you didn't have, t- you're not wearing tall boots, you might be worried about losing your shoes. But uh, your we friend wouldn't wear tall boots. Brielle's got tall boots. That's just silly. We're in the jungle. <laughs> The wizard wasn't prepared Sorry. for it. The wizard wasn't prepared for jungle. He may be Vane rich. is the image of misery right now. Oh. Just book tucked and rolled, trying to cover his head. His crocs are just full of mud. <laughs> but they're so comfy. <laughs> he was going towards vacation. <laughs> like, he came to Chult, but his luggage went to Evermead. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bummer. <laughs> um, like, a, like a wet cat right now. Braille's used to it. She isn't minding it. Is it at least a little bit cooler? Oh, yes. It is, it is way cooler. Yeah, Rick Sitter's not going to complain one bit. Braille pulls her hood off and takes her hair down and soaks that up. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're going miserably. Um, it's miserably ish. Yeah. No, it's, it's misery. There's only this one's miserable. <laughs> I think the others are fine with it. Except for the mud. I mean, walking through mud sucks. Yeah. But Especially when it's that. I imagine Gilly would be having a little bit of a rough go with it. Yeah. Do you, do you want to ride? Yes, please. Okay, and I'll just like scoop you up. Yes. You can sit on my shoulder. So you guys are trudging along. Gilly is riding. Rixer. Mm-hmm. Um, rain is not letting up, and it's just it's just the wind isn't too bad. Um, but I need you guys to make a Constitution save. Oh, I should be good at this. This is against uh, a level of exhaustion. Mm. Well, due to due to the extraneous. Yep. Would Gilly still have to do it even though she's not walking for most of the time? I'll give her advantage. Okay, that's really good. <laughs> I rolled d twelve. Yeah. Like I almost, shit, a four. I, oh, I, never mind. <laughs> I almost grabbed mine earlier. We're making a twenty-two. Wow. Miserable nice. but grim and determined. Yeah, Ru, Ru Vane has got this. He's doing fine. Uh, Rixer also got a 22. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Rixer's feeling fine. Gilly got a 16. Nice. You're wet and a little miserable, but uh, not well, doing too bad. The lowest, but no. I got an 18. 18, you guys are, you guys are keeping your, keeping your heads about you. Mm-hmm. We have some experience in similar <laughs> things. Some experience in yeah. drudgery. Yeah. The, the wizard does not. Mm-hmm. The rest of us, yes. It must be. We all seem to have pretty pretty decent backgrounds in the outdoors and stuff. Um, so you're, you're doing your best to follow the trail, and of course Nico is, um, she, she knows her way. Right. And any time that you guys seem to like be unsure or, or the path diverts, um, she'll say, oh, no, no, it is, it is this direction. I know. Come along. This storm won't last forever, and we'll have... Well, soon enough we'll have clear skies and we'll Are be dry. Are you sure about that? <laughs> I I am sure. The sun always shines again, Cholt. Uh, Brielle signs sucking up buttercup. Mm-hmm. Um, is the rain so... Because s- you said it was really heavy. Is it so heavy that it's obscuring at all? Yeah, absolutely it is. It is. Yeah, oh, okay. I figured. Um, absolutely it is that. Yeah. Um, and probably also covering other... Things sounds as they travel, which yeah. is which is good because it's obscuring our iron, iron giant that we're carrying. Around. Yeah. Um, oh no, they probably have the good sense to get out of this. Yeah, <laughs> While we're traveling, um, Brielle would like to keep a keep a eye on what she can. So I'm assuming a disadvantage one. Yes. Or perception. Yes. Just to listen and hear for anything that was pretty good. Like that same. First one was lower, but that's fine. Still wasn't bad. Uh, what is my presumption? Fifteen. You, I mean, things seem to be you know hunkered down against the rain, as far as you can tell. You, you're definitely going to be aware that you know out uh, very far, you're not going to 
to be able to see or hear right. anything at all. She wants to just kind of keep an eye on and listen for anything that might be getting close. And what is your passive? Her something? passive is a 16, I think? Yeah, 16. Okay. So, a solid hour into this storm. And an hour in a heavy rainstorm definitely feels like a lot longer. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're following this, this, this game trail that EQ seems to be pointing out to you. You guys can't hardly tell that it's anything but just muck and, you know, weeds and uh, bushes and grass. And uh, you're coming al- uh, around an, an exceptionally large, um, I don't know, overgrown jungle fol- foliage, essentially. When, uh, one, two, three, four. Let me roll my d4 here. Well, one, I guess, would count for the two, Rixer and Gilly, because you're okay. being carried. One, two, three. There's also three. Fine. <laughs> and, the, and the Iron Giant. And the Iron Giant. So I'm going to roll a d6. Three roll sixes. That's what I usually do. <laughs> one, two, three again. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's fate. fate. It's fate. It's, it's fate. fate. Um, Brielle, mm-hmm. this very large, um, jungly foliage launches itself at you, mm-hmm. and there are tendrils, and a mouth seems to just kind of like open up wide. No, thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, I don't like him. See here, I should actually read this. Oh, it just happens. Okay, cool. Um, and you are engulfed by a shambling mound. Oh. No, this is going to be twice my life, and this is not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like this is a great place to end the episode. Uh, you can almost hear a scream come from Brielle. Luckily, you guys are clustered well enough that the rest of you see this happen. You see this this mound of decaying rotting foliage open itself up and just totally surround and one second Brielle is there the next you don't see Brielle but this creature is definitely existing in, a, in her place hey that's all for tonight thanks for listening if you want to get to know us better you can find us on Facebook Twitter and Instagram at Monday Night TPK you can also find Monday Night TPK at Above the Table Games on YouTube. Don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps us out. Thanks for listening, and we'll always save a seat at the table just for you. Have a good night. Our attack time is one zero one point one two five milliseconds.